All right, we're in uh, the chat in Luke's Gospel, chapter 9. <clears throat> and uh, we have three things that we're going to be looking at. You know, it's far more than you could ever imagine, you know, covering in 50 minutes or 45 minutes. But uh, <clears throat> the three I put up on the board. The first thing is uh, Peter's confession of Christ. Remember Jesus had... Whom do men say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And remember Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. What an incredible, you know, confession. And Luke words it a little bit different than Matthew worded it. But it's okay. <coughs> and so we're going to be looking at that. That's really a pivot point in the life of, in the Gospels actually. Uh, Peter's made two great confessions. The first one was... <coughs> Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Remember that? You know, God revealed to him his sinfulness. There's no salvation until God reveals to you your sinfulness. No question about it. The old uh, ways of thinking of things, when I was a boy coming up, we called it Holy Spirit conviction. You don't hardly hear that much, but you know, yeah, I heard it in the sermon. This morning. Holy Spirit conviction is when the Holy Spirit reveals to you you're sinful. He reveals to you not some little petty sin, but the fact that your nature is lost and without hope, without God, and your need to be saved. Sinfulness. So Peter had made that great confession. I'm a sinful man. And then the great confession he makes today is the revelation of Jesus Christ to, to his heart. And it takes God to do both of those. To reveal to your heart who Jesus is. Becomes real personal. We'll be looking at that a little bit. And then, as soon as Peter makes that confession, this is true in Matthew's account as well as in Luke's account, Jesus, for the first time, makes an announcement to his disciples about his being rejected in Jerusalem and... Uh, being crucified and dying on dying and being raised again. He included the resurrection in that. Over and over, Luke tells us that they didn't understand that. <clears throat> Matthew tells us that they didn't understand that because as soon as Jesus said, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to die in Jerusalem, I'm going to be buried, I'm going to be ro ro raised again, Peter immediately said, no! No, it shall not be. It won't, he stood in the way. And what did Jesus say? Get out of my way, Satan. You're in my way. My way is up to Jerusalem, to the cross, and to my death. You're in my way, Peter. <coughs> Peter got in the way a lot. Peter said things he didn't even know what he was saying sometimes. And he was unconsciously standing in the way of Jesus there. So, but Peter, this is a, a, a big plus for Peter right here. We'll talk about that in a moment. And then Jesus announced for the first time that he's going to die. He's preparing his disciples for what's coming. They needed to know this. And of course, they didn't understand it. They did not understand it until after it was all over. You know, they weren't waiting for the resurrection either, were they? They wasn't outside the grave on the third day waiting. Nobody was waiting. <coughs> No one. They just seem to miss this. You know, you know why you miss this? Why they miss it? They were blind to it. You see, not only I put two two things here. Not only does it take the Holy Spirit to reveal to you <clears throat> the person of Christ, in other, in other words, who he is, as this confession will do, we'll read it in a moment. That took the Holy Spirit. In the Matthew's account, when Peter made that confession, Jesus said to Peter, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for the flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but your Father in heaven. And so it took the Father, or you know, God, God Himself, God the Father, through the God the Holy Spirit, to reveal who the person of Jesus was to Peter. Now, watch one more thing. It also <laughs> takes the same power of God to reveal what the death of Jesus Christ means. Because in our natural state, in our carnal mind or our natural mind, the nature of man is repulsed by the cross. 
absolutely repulsed by the cross. The world that we live in today, the wisdom of this world, absolutely rejects the cross. You know, I, I have a little pet peeve about some of our hymnology nowadays. It kind of leaves it all out too. Not all of them. Don't go running around to Todd and tell him I said that. But you know, you know, sometimes in the, there was a movement in the seminarians and you know, the musicians and so on to move away from the blood because it was being rejected by the world. It's nauseating. It's repulsive because the modern world says, well, that's the way they explain things when they were, you know, a bunch of pagans or they were ignorant people. So they explain things in supernatural, you know, superstitious ways. Oh, no. It takes the Spirit of God for you to understand what that cross means. You can read it all you want to, but until God brings that heart to bear on your heart, you're not going to know the Lord. He, the Holy Spirit of God, not only brought Peter to know who the Jesus Christ really was, but he also, this was hidden to them until it was revealed to them. And it's the same thing today, and especially with Paul's revelation. When you get to Paul's revelation, because Paul makes it clear that the revelation that he received was hidden even from the Old Testament prophets. How are you going to figure that one out? You're not. You're going to read Paul and reread Paul and read Paul and reread Paul and then ask God to show you. He'll show you. The Holy Spirit has to open that up to us. Now, the reason I took this Bible away a little bit, the preacher preached on this, but I'm not going to preach on it, but I'm going to read it to you, this part of it. It says this, God hath revealed this wisdom unto us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, the Spirit of the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of a man that's in him, even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, Paul says, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. But the natural man, this is the nature of the natural man, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual, he goes on, the one who is spiritual can know these things, judge these things, and so on. This is foolishness to the world. The cross is foolishness. And you know, one of the things we'll learn this morning in the lesson, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God. There it is. The power of God unto salvation. And so it's through the gospel, that cross, and God revealing that meaning of that cross. He died for us. But when, it, when you get down to it, he died for you. You know, that's, that's when you're saved, when you realize not only who he is, but he died for you. That's when the cross becomes yours. It's personal. He died for you. And then, beyond that, you begin to realize the Christian way of life is that, and it's this. Christ lives in you. Christ lives in you. And it, this is part of the warning here. The, the third part here, he gives a warning about the true nature of life. And it's not by pursuing your own interests. The true nature of life, this is very serious because if you miss this, you, you lose your soul. You lose your soul. The true meaning of life is not self-interest. The true meaning of life is not doing your will. You see, that this, these words meant a lot when Jesus said, if any man wants to follow me, he must do what? He must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And then Jesus said, if anyone, what if, what if it profit? What profit is there? What economic advantage? What profit is it for any man that if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul when he could have been saved? Or what would you give in exchange for your soul when you've lost it and before the throne, the great white throne judgment, and you're going to 
You're going to bargain with God about how you're going to win back your soul. Jesus won it back right here. If we miss the cross, we miss everything. The way of the cross leads home. Leads home. And that home's a good place. Uh, not the other place. All right, let's go into this. Uh, uh, in verse, we started verse 18 today. And verses 18 through 20, we're going to read, I'm going to read this, what Peter had to say. It says uh, in Peter's confession, it says, and, if that, and it came to pass, as he was alone praying, Jesus being alone, he was praying. His disciples were with him. And he asked them, saying, Whom say the people that I am? Verse 19. They answering said, Well, some said John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. Elias is the Greek transliteration for Elijah. Uh, and others say that one of the old prophets is risen again. And then Jesus said to them, "What? But whom do you say that I am? And you know, Peter in rare style, he answers for him, don't he? He answers. If you go through, Peter always answers. And so Peter said this. He said, Peter answered him and said, the Christ of God. The Christ of God. In Matthew 16, 16, when Matthew records that, it gives a little bit more where Peter says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so that took care of the humanity of Christ, the deity of Christ, and the Messiahship of Christ. It took it, it, took it all in. You know, when Andrew came to Peter for the first time, Andrew came to him and before Peter ever knew Jesus or had never met Jesus, Andrew said, Come. We found the Messiah. See, he was back then, the Messiah. But their idea of a Messiah was one who would come, would be like one of the judges in the Old Testament. They'll come and they'll throw off the enemy, you know, and allow the Jews to be free again from the Romans, that kind of thing. And a lot of them had that thinking about it. They didn't know the true nature of Jesus. They considered him, some of them, to be a Messiah, an anointed person. But all, Isaiah was anointed. It was, many people were anointed. And so they didn't understand. Here's the great confession of who Jesus was at that point in, their, in, in history and who he is. He's the, he's the Son of God, the living God. He is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Thou art the Christ. The word Christ means Messiah. Hebrew, Messiah, the word <coughs> Greek. The Greek word is Christ. Christ and Messiah... It's exactly the same word. One is in Hebrew, the other is in Greek. Okay, so it means the anointed one. All right, so that's, our, that's the confession. Uh, and then right after that confession, look at, verse, <clears throat> look at verse 21. And he And he straightly charged them and commanded them <clears throat> to tell no man that thing. Right, at that point, he didn't want to arouse a lot of people's animosity. Uh, a lot these Jews, you know, any, any earlier than what's happening to them. He had some other things he had to do before he went to the cross. So he didn't want that to be known right now. You know, he, that's something that's going to be hid from others. And in verse 22, uh, he says, saying, and see that goes to verse 21. So he commanded them not to tell anybody. Saying, saying what? He said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and the, pro and the chief priests and the scribes and be slain and be raised the third day. There it is. That's the first announcement in Luke's Gospel and also it's parallel to Matthew's too. It's the first announcement. After Peter's confession, there's that first announcement that he's going to die. He's going to Jerusalem. He'll be rejected by all the religious leaders of that day. Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, all of them. And so he says the religious, he says the, the elders, rejected of the elders, that's the people in power in Jerusalem among the Jews, the chief priest, that's the Sadducees mainly, and the scribes, that's the lawyers. The scribes were the lawyers. They were the ones who interpreted the law. They were the religious leaders, but they, they were like the PhDs 
uh, in the in the uh, the law of Moses. And, you know, they that was their whole life, the law of Moses. They were the lawyers. And so they would reject Jesus, and then he would be slain and be raised a third day. Now, before I read the next part, let me go back just for a moment to the Matthew account. When Jesus makes that announcement in the book of Matthew, and I've already alluded to it, that's when Peter said, No. That's when Peter said, no, far from you. You're not going to die in Jerusalem. You're not, we're not going that route. And that's when Jesus said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're in my way. The way that Jesus was going was to that cross. He was born to go to that cross. Listen, had he been born, even of a virgin, had he been born and uh, worked miracles, had he been born and preached and healed the sick and made the blind to see and all that and he'd not gone to the cross, there'd be no salvation. That cross was the reason where he was headed. On the way, he was showing mankind what the love of God is. He kept on loving and man kept on hating. He kept on loving, man kept on hating. What was going to end up? How's that going to end up? It ended in the cross. Away with him. We'll not have this man to rule over us. That's what they had to say. And there were Jews that said that, not Gentiles. Gentiles had nothing to do with this. He came to his own, and his own received him not. Now, to as many as received him, to them he gave the authority to become the children of God. But he came into his own, meaning to his own uh, race, the Jewish race, if I can use that word race, I don't usually use it. But you had Gentiles, they were Jews. All right, Jews. All right, so, so we have we have here the confessing and the following of Jesus. Now let's go to the following part. Here's where the warning comes in. Look at verse the following part, verse 23. After he says, I'm gonna die in Jerusalem, I'm gonna be raised on the third day. Remember, they can't understand this. If you keep on reading the Gospel of Luke, which I did this week, you'll see over and over how they didn't understand. They didn't understand this. And so it, it takes the Holy Spirit to reveal that. So in verse 23 then, he says, And he said to them, he said to them all, I want to emphasize the all, he said to them all, now, now, you know, some of the theologians say, okay, is, was that all the disciples? There was 12 of them that was with him. Or was there others there? Was other people there? He said to all. So whoever was there, it's all. Uh, but we could, could we extend that to everybody? You know, anyone who wants to follow the Lord. He said to all, if any man will come after me. Now i got to stop. When he says, if any man will come, this word will is a, has, it's a volition word. It's the volition. It's the will of man. It's man's will or desire. If you have a desire to come, and that has to originate in man, although, again, nothing that God does in redemption is apart from the revealing work of the Holy Spirit. You understand? The Holy Spirit was there in the beginning in Genesis 1-2 when the earth was absolutely frozen. And it was nothing but water. You see, if you have no light, you have no heat. And the earth was absolutely in a frozen state. There was no way to, for life to be there. And the scripture says, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And it says, the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep. And the word there, the Hebrew word for incubating like a mother hen, incubating the egg. So he was creating that incubation. And brought forth light. And then Paul said, "The one who commanded the light in, the one who commanded the light in the darkness, has shown into our heart the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ." What does it take to get your heart, your frozen, hard, Baptist heart, whatever it is, frozen, frozen, the frozen chosen? What does it get to warm that up? The Holy Spirit of God has to reveal this right here to it. We said last week, I hope you remember last week, how do you know, how can you love the Lord Jesus Christ? 
There's two requirements for the love of Jesus Christ, if you love him. First of all, you've got to know that you are a sinful person. That sense, remember I put it right here, the sense of the sinful. And then you've got to know that he's forgiven you. That he took every sin on the cross in his own body. He poured out his soul unto death. And he died there for you and for me. He paid the penalty. And so when I know I'm a sinner, and I know that I'm forgiveness, forgiven because I've received him. I've received him as my Lord and Savior. You know, I've, I trust in him. I believe in him. I trust in him. You know, and it's not just me. It's, it's not my mere faith. It's the faith of the Son of God, which he has allowed me to share. His faithfulness. He has given that to us. So we have the sinfulness, we have the assurance of sal we have the assurance of forgiveness. That equals what? <clears throat> love. That's the ingredients for love. I love him what? Because he what? First loved me. This is the first love me part. I get to love him back because my sins are forgiven. My sins are gone. They're underneath the blood of the cross of Calvary. As far as the east is from the west, he remembers them no more. My sins are gone. Your sins are gone at the cross. If you have that assurance then, then you have a reason to love him. Right? You have a big reason to love him. I mean, you don't have to be a crook and a bank robber to love the Lord because he forgave you. You probably got some things to say grace over in your own life, <laughs> you know. A lot of stuff you sure don't want to testify to. But he knows your heart, and he has forgiven you. Isn't that wonderful? We are forgiven. And so, when we go to this verse, in verse 23, he takes this up in verse 23. He says, And he said unto them, all, all of them, If any man shall come after me, if it's his will, if it's his desire to come, he says, then what do you have to do? He says, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now, I, I don't think, I shouldn't say this, but I guess, I think he's talking about discipleship here. This is not the way we know about <clears throat> salvation. Salvation, our being saved is never conditional on whether we're going to fulfill something. But this is discipleship, no question. He is talking to his disciples. You know, they are finally being called apostles. They're going to be sent for a lifetime. Everything changes after this for them. They're, they're going to be his apostles. And they'll be sent out after this. And, and, a, and great authority and power. And so I think he's saying to the disciples, if we put it right into context, to these men that are going to be apostles. If you're going to be my disciple, are you going to be, if you're going to follow me, <clears throat> remember he said to Matthew, follow me. Remember he said to Peter and James and John, follow me. And so if they're going to follow him, they got to do what? They can't come with their own agenda. You know, but Lord, I have a program I think will really work in your church. Oh, no. No, there's no program that you have that has anything to do with the divine viewpoint. And so it's, it's important to, for us to see this. This denial takes on a new meaning. When, when he says you deny yourself, when you look at that cross, that changes everything. When he says deny yourself, when you look at Jesus, what did he do? He denied himself, didn't he? He didn't come to do his own will. He said that. He says, I've come not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. He didn't come for a vacation or relaxation. He came to die. And he suffered. He was troubled from this time onward because he knew the death that he was going to die. <clears throat> the scripture says he was troubled in his soul because he knew that the taking on the sins of the world would be the, would be the blackest thing the spiritual death that he would suffer for those three hours on the cross, crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was taking our place, taking our position. All right, so <clears throat> I found this little jewel. I love these little jewels sometimes in the reading. 
Shortly before General Robert E. Lee, now if you don't know who he is, you know, he's, he's pictured in my, my den where I sit and read. I have two or three pictures of him on the wall, so if you, want, if you don't know who he is, well then I'm sorry for you. But anyway, for, shortly before General Robert E. Lee died, he was asked by a young mother to bless her baby. They used to bring children to him. You remember they brought children to Jesus? And, you know, he would take them into his arms, and he would bless them. And so they brought, this mother brought her baby to Jesus, to, I mean, to Robert E. Lee. He was a Christian man. Robert E. Lee was one of the greatest Christians uh, in that whole period of time. And so he took the baby in his arms. He looked at the baby, and then he turned to the mother and looked at her. And then he said these unforgettable words. This is what he said. Teach him to deny himself. That is all. He gave the baby back. Think about it. Teach him to deny himself. That is all. Instead of indulging a child, and we have the overindulgent child today. Instead of indulging children, he would turn over his grave now if he saw what this mess has come out to be in our culture. No, Jesus from the very beginning denied himself. All the way through, he had denied himself. All the way through his life. He didn't do what other little children would want to do. He did not follow some sinful desire. He did not. He didn't fall into a temptation and follow it like other kids would, would have done. Peer pressure. No, he went all the way. All the way to the cross. And so, what changes then? When we deny ourselves, what changes? Circumstances change. Our money situation changes. Things change. Relationships change. Thinking changes. Our methods change. Our plans, our commitments, our beliefs change. When we deny ourselves to follow Him. When we take up the cross to follow Him. A cross. The lesson of the cross is the hardest lesson the believer has to learn. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. He says, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. What is that? That means, you know, the hardest thing that we, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer, you're a Christian, you're a believer. The hardest lesson we have to learn, the hardest lesson that we have to learn is this lesson of taking up our cross. Taking up my cross and denying myself means that when I have a certain thing I want to do, when I know God's will is this, and I choose God's will over what I want. You know, do you ever do that? you ever just choose God's will? When you know God's will in, in a certain matter, and you choose that over what you want. And, you know, so it's, it's so important to see that. And, what, and so the self-directed life is full of guilt. In other words, I have my way. You know, who, who was it? Ben Crosby or something? I had it my way. Whoever said that? If I have it my way in life, here it is. The self-directed life, when I get my way, is filled with guilt, worry, discouragement, discord, frustration, fear, and disobedience. While the Christ-directed life, get this, is filled with love, joy, peace, patience, trust, and obedience. Listen to this. How do you know that Christ is directing your life? There's a quietness and a peace and a reality about the believer wherein Christ is in control. Uh, a believer who is in the carnal state, he's going to be shifty. He's going to be uptight uh, about his religion. But I tell you what, relaxed mental state, relaxed mental attitude belongs to those where the Spirit of God is leading, and you're following the Spirit of God in this life, the true life that Christ died that we might have. Uh, let me go with this one here. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Wow. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, nevertheless I live, but it's not I that lives, but it's Christ that lives in me. He realized that Christ's life was in him. He was realizing the life of Christ in him. 
And then he says, I live it by the faith of the Son of God. Some of your translations says, I live it by believing in him, but uh, the old English says, I live it by the faith of the Son of God. His faith, his faithfulness. His faithfulness here. His faithfulness in, in your life. He is in you, both willing, but working to, in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. The Holy Spirit of God. The mind of Christ. You know, the Bible is the mind of Christ. It's the word of the Father. It's the voice of the Holy Spirit. And, and that the, all three of those come together in the Christian way of life to lead us in the way that in the light the true life as I put it up there. All right now in verse 24 it says, "For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it." All right so when you give up yourself life, then life begins to flow. Just like Galatians 2 and verse 20. Paul is shown right there in that verse how he gave up his life to live a life where Christ is living in him. Now that little verse that we just read, have, have you thought about that a lot? Whoever will save his life will lose it. No. Uh, if you go save your life, means you save it for yourself. You save it to you have your way. My way or the highway. <laughs> You're going to do it my way. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. And, and, and we have self-interest, don't we? All of us do. It's the biggest problem with man is selfishness. You know, your way, your arrogance, your pride. It's a part of, you know, that's arrogance and pride on the part of man. My way. And so it's either God's way or your way. It's either the divine viewpoint or the human viewpoint. And God says of that, he says, my ways are not your ways. Uh, neither are my thoughts your thoughts. As the heavens are above the earth, so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts, and my ways higher than your ways. Wow. You know, I, I, I need to adopt the ways of God. I need to think about his wisdom and, and not go the other right way. So he says, whoever shall save his life will lose it. The idea of, you know, losing the life uh, is down in verse 25. Uh, if you go to verse 25, it says, For it is a man advantaged if he gained the whole world. That's the idea of you gaining through your, what you want. And lose himself or be cast away. And the idea of losing oneself, I went and made a Greek study of it. The idea of losing your life is uh, uh, it has a re reference to death. It has a reference to laying waste. You know, I, I, I remember when I was teaching, used to teach in high school, you know, some of the kids would come out, you know, Monday morning, and uh, this is high school now, and they'd say, well, I got wasted Saturday night. Well, that's the idea, loss. You got wasted. Your life is wasted. Wasted years, wasted years. Oh, how foolish. So the idea of laying waste of a city or a heritage, of losing life, property, or other objects, uh, it's of being demoralized, morally abandoned, or ruined as children under bad influences are ruined or morally disadvantaged, of destroying and perishing. Perishing. Remember John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only... Son, you know, the whosoever believeth on him should not perish. I hear not perish, but have everlasting life. So I, I guess no one can be sure exactly what Jesus was talking about here, whether he's talking about wasting your life in the temporal sense. You know, you live, you know, 50 years and you just wasted it, or whether you lost your soul completely and went to hell. <clears throat> you know, I guess you could bring in some of that. But the point is, it's a waste. Uh, if, if we talk about the disciples, here's what I think the true meaning is, because Paul used this word. Paul says, I keep my body into subjection. Remember that? That having pre in other words, I bring my body into subjection. To what? Subjection to the, to the Spirit of God. Not my way, Lord, your way. I bring my body into subjection, that having preached to others, I myself would not become a castaway. 
So if Paul had to bring his own life under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, how much more do I need that? Because he knew, he feared that to not do that, but to follow just Paul, he knew he would become a castaway. Paul could have become a castaway. But he didn't. He was faithful to the end. You know, a lot of people start off real bright, Carol. You know, they start off really, oh, I love the Lord, but it's not very long and you can't even find them. <laughs> so the idea is to, to, to finish well. You know, we're older people in the room. The idea is to finish well. Don't give up at, at the end and make a fool out of yourself. Somebody said there's no fool like an old fool. <laughs> so we don't, so you see what I'm saying? Saul, King Saul said of himself, he says, I have played the fool. And none of us are, are exempt from this warning here that we, it's not about our will. It's not about what we want. We must deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him who died on the cross that we might have life and have it more abundant. And so that's sort of losing. He says if you lose it, you lose that life, that abundant life, and uh, whatever the doom of the un impenitent. Now, verse 26. For, he says, For whomsoever shall be ashamed of me and my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in the Father's and of the holy angels. All right, now we've got a couple of things there, several things. Look here. We have, we have the Word of God, Jesus' words. We have, and, 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 Paul, uh, and, and uh, Luke is saying, uh, or Jesus is saying, if you're ashamed of my words, then I'm going to be ashamed of you when I come in my glory. Right there. When I come in my own glory. So what does that mean? Well, in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, it said that Jesus himself endured the shame. Jesus endured the shame when he went to the cross. They stripped him naked, nailed him up there, and he, he suffered the shame, spit upon, all the things. So the public disgrace attracting to the crucifixion, he endured the shame, so too. In uh, Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Now, are you ashamed of Jesus? You know, there's this, uh, in my reading, uh, you know, sometimes when preachers tell things, you don't know whether it's true or not, but the story was that there was a boy, he just got saved as a young boy, and, and he came down in the old country church, and he, he wanted to tell folks how you know, about his experience of grace. And he was a little nervous, so he stuttered a little bit, you know, like I've always done. You know, stuttered a little bit, nervous, and some old grouch in the congregation said, sit down, boy, you ought to be ashamed of yourself talking like that. And the boy said, well, I, I am ashamed of myself, but I'm not ashamed of Jesus. I am ashamed of myself, but I'm not ashamed of Jesus. Are you ashamed of it? He said, a disciple, you can't be ashamed of your Lord. And Jesus made it clear to them, if they hated me, what are they going to do to you? They're going to hate you? If they crucified Jesus, what are they going to do to those disciples, those apostles, including the apostle Paul, who was decapitated? They're going to kill them. Every one of them was killed, martyred, except maybe John. Okay? And so, here's the last verse. We got to hurry. We got two minutes. Here's the last verse. This is good. If you read your lesson, I'm sure that you've thought about this. You should think about things a little bit longer than you take to think about things sometimes. You can call it pondering or meditating on something. Or go to sleep thinking about it and asking the Lord to help you see it. And here's what he said. He says, but... See that conjunction of contrast between what's uh, shameful, you know, them not being ashamed. And the last thing in verse 26 is the glory of his coming in glory. When is that? 
When Christ comes in glory, when is that? Well, you have the tribulation right here. See, the church goes out here at the rapture. That's the body of Christ. And you have the tribulation, which has to do with Israel, the remnant. And then you have Christ coming at the second advent. When he comes. That's when he comes, right there. Uh, back to uh, the ancient and the, and the, and the, uh, the saints of the old will be resurrected. So, he says, when I come in my glory. Uh, and then he says, but I tell you the truth. I tell you of a truth. There be some standing here. Now he's talking to a crowd maybe as big as this. He said, there's coming, there's coming a time. I tell you the truth. That there is some that is standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. Wow. Now where's the kingdom of God? I'll put it in blue. This is the kingdom of God right here. It's called a thousand year reign, right? The Christ on the earth. All right. Uh, he said 2,000 years ago, he said to a bunch of people there, there's some people here right now who won't die until they see that kingdom. All right, now, what do the theologians do with this? Oh, they're real perplexed about this. Well, I always taught that this was the transfiguration. Because what you'll go on and read, and you'll see Jesus took them up on a high mountain, Peter, James, and John, and he was glorified, glorified in their presence with Moses and Elijah. And, uh, and so they saw that glory. And that's what I always taught this to be. So there was three of them had seen the glory of that king, kingdom. Remember that old hymn, My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. You know, and uh, you know, whatever. But they did see the glory of the coming of the Lord. Peter, James, and John. But let's don't stop there. Some people go as far, and your lesson says, some people go as far and say, okay, this is that group of uh, 120 in the upper room at Pentecost. Well, they had tasted of the power of the age to come. This is the age to come. They had tasted of the power of the age to come. That's true. But here's mine now. I got a new thought about this. I haven't thought about it a lot. I haven't read. I've read a lot of stuff. And this is really good. Think about the resurrection morning. And Jesus was resurrected. Think about that he was glorified in, in the presence of 5,000 people at one time. They saw his glory and he was taken up from them. Had they not seen the, coming, the, the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is now realized with the resurrection. 5,000 at one time witnessed the glorified Christ and 40 days he was on the earth teaching them. About what? About the kingdom. All right. There it is. And my wife tells me that my time is up. <laughs> and we are right on time, aren't we? Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace. We know that these things are demanding and yet they are not burdensome because the work has been done. The Lord Jesus Christ has carried the load and he's called us unto himself to trust him, to know him, to become members of the body of Christ. Your grace by which we are saved. We thank you, Father, for your mercy, your grace. We pray you'll strengthen our faith and help us do follow, to follow in your word so that we are good disciples, good learners. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.